Thank you. So, uh, yes, I'm Leanne Perriman. You can tell I'm not him. And I'm a fellow with the OER Research Hub. And I spent the last year conducting some collaborative research with Tess India, who Tim represents, and Alison Buckler, who's also from the Open University, but isn't here today. And we have been researching the um, Tess India OER for Teacher Education project, and that's going to be our focus today. Now, firstly, I'd like to set the scene a little by talking about the notion of unfreedoms. The Nobel laureate Amartya Sen introduces unfreedoms as a key aspect of the international development context in which the Tess India project operates. And he says that unfreedoms uh, severely limit human beings' capacity to operate in society, in the world. And these unfreedoms can include uh, poverty, uh, limited uh, economic opportunity, inadequate education, and inadequate access to knowledge, and deficient healthcare and oppression. Now, the Commonwealth of Learning's three-year plan addresses unfreedoms and their role in development when it says that increasing the freedoms that men and women enjoy is a definition of development and greater freedom empowers people to be more effective agents of development. So it's not only personal freedom, it's freedom to keep the development um, chain of motion rolling. So how do open educational resources fit in? Well, it's an underlying premise of the TESS India project, along with other OER for international development projects, that OER can help to remove unfreedoms by um, training more teachers, leading to uh, better teachers, more engaged learners, and then improve learner retention and increase in education for all. So, You've already heard that our focus is OER localization. Now, um, localization, in essence, is the adaptation of resources to be more suitable for the end users to, uh, for whom they're intended. And this is particularly important where uh, resources are produced outside the countries in which they're to be used. In Test India, the resources have been produced uh, collaboratively with the UK Open University and academics in India, but still there is a need for localising those resources. Um, localisation has for a long time been the OER movement's one of the biggest challenges. And in 2005, David Wiley put it very succinctly, asking, what is the future of open education? Where is it going? I think there was only one answer, localisation. So, um, localisation, a very important consideration, and Tiffany Ivins, who I have um, taken a quote from on the screen, she did a PhD in OER localisation, she says that it must involve locals and that effective localisation is directly proportionate to understanding local context. And above all, she says, localisation unlocks the power of OER. Now, despite the vital importance of this, fairly little work has been done on OER localisation since David Wiley talked about its importance back in 2005. So, we cover four main areas in our research. We're covering the challenges to localising OER for use in development contexts. We're looking at the impact of context and the localised perceptions and how they impact on the localisation process. We've been looking at how best to support OER localisers. That's an area that's very rarely covered. And also the relationship between institution-led quality control, localiser freedom and the spirit of open, the spirit of openness. So, to provide a bit of context, 
about the areas in which Test India operates, the Indian education system. I'm going to share a few figures with you relative to three problems that are addressed by Test India, and they are a lack of teachers, poor quality of teaching, and poor learning standards. Now, um, India's education features a huge number of unqualified teachers, and currently, India needs 1.33 million teachers right away. In the state of Bihar in northern India, 75% of teacher education colleges did no training between 2007 and 2010. Staying in Bihar, 45% of teachers there don't have the minimum qualifications required for teaching. Ranging a little bit more widely in India, in some states, only 1% of teachers pass the teacher eligibility test that's mandatory for being a teacher. So you can see the scale of the, the problem that TESS India is addressing through the development of teacher education OER. The final quote I've put on the screen comes from the Deccan Herald, which is an Indian newspaper. It's reporting on the 2013 Annual Status of Education report. The report has been uh, conducted since 2005, and in 2013, the Deccan Herald says that it is just a ritual exercise bringing the same disturbing but worsening news. Standards are falling year on year in India, and that's what TESS India is um, trying to address. And I will hand you over to Tim, who will tell you a bit more about the TESS India project. Tim. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to talk um, a bit more about the practicalities of behind the, the project and um, outline the process uh, for localization. Um, so, uh, this in the actually stands for Teacher Education Through School Based Support in India. So, um, that's what we get to talk in that sense. And it's an OER based project, international development project from the Open University. Um, we have different funding. Which was received in November 2012, so we've been working since then. And this phase uh, ends in May 2015, so we're near the end of the project. Um, we're not working for the whole video, as we said, we're working in seven focus states, which you can see up here. And we're developing 125 pan Indian um, study units for teacher education in the areas up here um, at both primary and secondary. Uh, it's a collaborative development, so it's OU academics with Indian academics working to produce these materials. So the OU <coughs> side is bringing that pedagogic approach to it, whereas the Indian side is bringing more of the context and the curriculum focus. Um, but there is a lot of cross fertilisation around that, and it's a simple plan that's built now. Uh, the units are standalone, they're self directed, um, and they're about supporting teachers in changing their practice. Um, so they really have to enhance reflection. And Um, just a little bit about production. We are producing these materials using the OU structured content system, so it's an XML based system, so it allows us a lot of flexibility and we're producing these in multiple formats for which this uh, flexibility allows us to So you can just see up here um, the top image is um, the Moodle sites, so the right course of the Moodle sites so embedded video, um, the bottom one is one of our activities, there's lots of activities in these. Um, you can see over there on the left, uh, we have various different helpers for tablets and mobile phones, so we're using EPUB 3 formats. Um, and for the lower end spec phones, we're talking about future ones, we're using 3 gp video. Um, but by far one of the most uh, important for the very, very end user, the primary user, really, is, the, is the print version. So we have a print option as well. Um, so we're going through. So um, <coughs> those units will be developed in English, so that number of units will be developed in English. Um, and in terms of the process we've been through so far, we have focused on just the Hindi speaking states, that's three states, and within those three states we've focused on three subsets of materials, so that's elementary English, elementary science, and secondary maths. So not everything has happened, and we're, we're, we're running this as an interesting process. 
Um, so we started off with state-based orientation workshops, and these were sort of like material for review type workshops. They were normally about a day long, half a day long, and they were with senior state education organisations within, within the state. Um, and that was with a, a chance for them to understand the materials, understand the process that we might go through and what our reality is about. Um, and, uh, and some of that would be done in English and some of that would be done in Hindi. So all of the materials were translated into Hindi in this process of challenge the teaching before we, um, uh, before we worked on the localization or our adaptation process. We had a third party in NGO that we employed to be responsible for that whole process. Um, and they were responsible for employing the people that did that localization. And there were two specific types of people that they employed. And they were state localization managers and state lo uh, subject localization experts. Uh, so the state localization managers, they are responsible at a state level for a subject, and that's at primary and elementary. So there would be one individual who is responsible for that process and for the quality assurance of that material. The localization experts, there would be two of these per subject, per state, at each level, and they'd be responsible for actually doing that contextualization, doing that localization of those materials. So um, each individual at that level would have a set of three, seven, and eight unions that they need to, need to work on. And a key thing to, to note about this is there was no control, no direct control over the adaptation. And what I mean by that is in some of our other overall projects, We've been directed in saying these are the areas you can localise, these are the areas you can't, in terms of being able to maintain integrity of the OER. But in this case, we said everything was open for adaptation. What we did do, though, was we guided the localisers through the process at these you know, workshops um, to maintain the pedagogic approach to the teaching. So we didn't want the teaching to change and had to stay as it was, but we were open for adaptation. Um, Oh, actually, just missed my question. At these localization <coughs> workshops um, in states, they were about two to three days long. Um, and the idea of that was that we have at least one unit to very high level drafts which come out at the end of that um, in order for everyone to understand that process. Thanks, Tim. So, what did we find were the main challenges of localizing OER? Managing translation, use of the Hindi keyboard, nav navigating localizer perception of experience as educators in India, navigating the localizer unfamiliarity with OER, openness and online learning, and as I've said already, the relationship between institutional control, quality, localizer freedom, and openness. And I'll take each one of those in turn. So, the challenges of translation, and they were the challenges. The resources were initially produced in English. The localizers in India didn't have the translation skills, and so the resources were taken to a translation agency who, in turn, didn't have the contextual knowledge or the pedagogical knowledge. And that led to then some distortion of meaning when they came back to the localizers. And the localizers then would need to correct this but they'd have to look at the English version to do so. So you can see quite a complex situation regarding the languages involved. Tim's already briefly mentioned this as well, that very few of the localizers were able to use a Hindi keyboard. So they were annotating hard copies, um, scribbling on them. These would then have to be typed back in again. And not only did that slow the process down, but it also added a level of quality control that needs to be part of the management process, so it further complicated things. Now, the um, localization experts had commonly a background as textbook writers for the Indian education system, and this had a number of implications that had to be navigated throughout the workshops. Firstly, they tended to prioritize subject over method, over pedagogy. Uh, and that's common in the um, textbook writing system. The Chess India OER prioritized pedagogy over subject, and so that had to be navigated. 
um, one of the, so the academics explained that many of the learning artists had PhDs and they really wanted to engage more with the topic than the technique and they thought that the teachers should have all subject knowledge in one place. The te ex textbook writers also had a preference for formal language, formal writing style over conversational writing style, and it was a con conversational writing style that was featured in the Tessinia resources, and so there was quite a bit of negotiation over, over that. Finally, the localizers typically weren't familiar with the activity-based pedagogy that featured in the resources, and so time had to be built into the workshops for inducting the localizers on this style of teaching and learning. I'll hand you back to Tim now, and he'll talk a little bit more about some of our findings. Okay, so um, what we wanted to do really, or what we have done, is, is look at um, OER and what that means for developmental development of OER. And so what we've done is we've taken um, a very fine piece of work that came out of the School of Fellowship. Um, the OER Engagement Ladder by Joan Wilde, which talks about the stages of engagement you go through in terms of OER, and looked at how that relates to development, so how it relates to the development of the top of um, And I think what you can see is for those people that started, and it was true for our, uh, our, our situation, was those with no understanding of OER in those contexts, no understanding of OER. Um, and none of the same depth of the process we might go through to develop OER, um, saw the, the units that we produced as very directive, uh, or what you could say is that they perceived them as having a more of a neo-colonial approach to education and to development. This is obviously not the case. We worked collaboratively to produce these, um, and by our understanding, because we're quite high about that, uh, we know that implicitly in that are these. So you can then see how, as someone starts to understand OER, we are, and they move up into new understanding, they can start to reflect back on the fact that you can't be necessarily that direct, or you don't need to be that direct, but OER is there up to the main change and So you can see that those people involved, as they move up the ladder, they start to move through from a near clone approach of perception of near clone to one more huge partnerships. Um, and this is very key, not just for those individuals who have been localizers, and not you know, in terms of their own uh, relationship with OER, but it's very key in terms of those people doing projects around adaptation to really understand that it's not just the ability of people to adapt OER, but it's actually the contextualization and the adaptation of the process within itself to be able to, to make that sense. So, for example, um, within our own context where there is a hierarchical view of knowledge ownership and you know as we have mentioned before where teachers are, are potentially seen as inferior and don't have uh, anything of quality to bring for that uh, uh, so you can see that it's going to maybe take a lot longer to get onto that first one with the lab if you like so therefore you need to adapt the processes that you're going through to be able to support that um, so it's really about that sort of supportive process to And just finally, from, from the bit that we're talking about here, is if we have a look at this uh, diagram, we can see how some of the high level characteristics of the engagement matter map onto what we would accept as being more uh, uh, high level to knowledge partnerships. So it's about the competitiveness of the institution, it's about the sensitivity to the context in that sense, and it's about the understanding of, um, of OER and what that means to you. To, uh, Work in a collaborative way, which feeds into this idea of not in partnership movement from that, um, to open to embedded engagement with OER. So, what we're really saying is that the more you engage with OER, and the more the way you support people in engaging in that process, contextualizing that process, it makes it implicit that by engaging with OER, you move from this near colonial approach to this more partnership approach to developing. So, what we're going to do So to conclude, I'd like to share with you an emergent model that has uh, been developed from the findings of our research. And this model um, maps the relationship between 
institutional control in OER projects between localizer freedom and openness. And to do that, we have found it useful to compare TESS India with another UK OER-led OER project, TESSA, which were in sub-Saharan Africa. And TESS India on this model is represented by the red shape. And I should say that this isn't a quantitative model. The numbers are just there to show the direction of the fixed elements that are in the model. Now, in TESS India, as uh, Tim mentioned earlier, there was a, a fairly uh, free approach to, in terms of institutional control. The localizers had quite a lot of freedom to adapt resources. And yet, there weren't that many changes made. So, oh, true openness was actually quite limited. In TESS Africa, or TESSA, there's quite a directive initial process where the control was much tighter on behalf of the um, institution. And as a result, the localizers had less freedom. But in fact, there was more openness as a result. And more changes were made um, within this framework. And um, the Tess India Academic Manager acknowledged that, that she would have liked to have seen more from these state people and localizers gave an example of things that they could have put in there. So if um, they wanted to see more assessment done in the classroom or more attention paid to low achievements, that could have been incorporated in the adaptation of the resources. Uh, so if she wanted more radical localization, more than safe localization. And again, she points to this reluctance, this deference to do with a hierarchical ownership of knowledge that has got in the way of this. So I hope that our presentation has, I think it has applicability across all the OER contexts where you're not writing resources, developing resources for end users of the same cultural context as, as you are in. Um, the model, as we said, is emergent and we'll be continuing to research around its applicability. Um, and we'd be really, really happy to answer any questions. Yeah. We have questions, and I'd ask you if you ask a question to please say your name and who you're representing while you're here. It helps us all to get to know each other better at the conference. Hi, I'm Schwalbert from Jora. I'm just wondering is the lack of localization was that because there's this lack of teaching teachers and teaching quality? Is that part of it? Or? Right, there wasn't a <laughs> so the lack of localization. Or was it just the logistics of your project just didn't allow for that? Or? Yeah, so I think as well. In terms of what we're talking about, what we're talking about, what we're talking about. So without having the boundaries set by that, they can really see that there's much need to change the difference in other projects where you're saying maybe actually this is what needs changing, you're actually more direct to say this is where we can So when you have boundaries by which you set, kind of, you seem to set to be more changes in that sense, whereas when it's open, you can actually have more changes. Yeah, I would say that's the case. Um, yeah, so we had a level of, level of control, they really want to be faithful. Um, hi, Tom Salmon from Sussex. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, just, I wanted to ask about the last points that you were making about the differences between TESSA and TESS India. Um, and I was wondering whether you would have said something uh, along the lines of it Time, you were saying sort of regimes of knowledge and knowledge hierarchy, um, but would it be fair to say that there are very different cultural contexts in each of the two projects and that I mean, it's very difficult to quantify or model anything like that? But um, would that have had a lot to do with differences as you go through the projects? So I don't know how, if you'd like to say anything on, on whether that, how you would say something about that. But. Yeah, yes, uh, you're absolutely right that context is key. Context is key to understanding uh, to assess for any OER thing. And definitely in the end, we can quite a differential and hierarchical approach to knowledge. So if an expert that has written some resources, there's a great resistance to change it. Well, you know, an expert has written it, I'm going down the knowledge mile of the thing. Where the same isn't necessarily the case in the entire African context. And even 
say it's not a if we're generalising across a huge area, there is a sort of different approach to that. Um, I, think I think that is actually right. I think the other, you, you spoke with, briefly, we spoke with um, last week about comparisons to the report, which we're about to do, which is just not necessarily about, but you're actually right. But one of the things is, as well as the, not just the people context, the cultural context, but in the way that the two projects were, um, we, we specifically saw people out and paid them to do this work. So their, their, um, their, 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 their motivations are very different from the people that are there. They were actually identified with institutions, so it's institutionally related, so it's part of their workload, it's part of their possibly expanding within the, within the institution itself. So it's, it's a cultural uh, context, but also. Is there anything that you two would like to say that wasn't in your presentation or you'd like to move forward at the moment? Well, I think I just mentioned the comparison between TESA and TES India. If um, it gives the OER research hub website, <coughs> there's a link to our OCWC paper that makes that comparison. So if you're interested in looking at the Institute of too, then there's much more, there's much more detail there. Was there a Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Give him a final hand.